you don't have to turn there. I just want to read a couple of verses in uh, Revelation chapter 5. This is what we're going to be doing for all of eternity, what we just did this morning. Worthy is a lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. We won't have to ask the Lord to, to pick us up uh, when we sin in heaven, but this is what we'll be doing, singing his praises. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. And really that's, um, he is really the, the, the focus of what we want to look at uh, this morning. I'm just going to log in here. I want to focus on the, the end times and, and Christ's millennial reign, but everything is about him, and um, we're going to be with him and forever. The, uh, the next big event on our calendar, what, what is it for Christians? If you don't want to say it out loud, tell it to the person beside you. What's, what's the next event on the Christian calendar, so to speak? What's going to happen next? The rapture, right. When we are caught up to be with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4. We're not going to talk a lot about that this morning, but it says in that chapter, encourage one another and we will be forever with the Lord. So from that time on, and we'll look at a, a chart in, in a few minutes, from that time on we will be with the Lord as, as believers. Wherever he is, we will be. And so let's look at that um, a little bit. <laughs> so you see two pictures up here. And I thought yesterday, well, it's kind of a, a play on words, but am I caught up with, with my daily activity or am I waiting for the Lord's shout to be caught up to be with him? And our lives just get so busy. I don't know about you, but um, it's just so easy to get focused on the everyday normal things of life, school, work, family, that sometimes we just forget that things are going to change and the Lord is coming back. Um, and so hopefully this, this morning will be a, maybe a chance to, to refocus uh, some of those things. Um, just before we start, I just wanted to offer a little disclaimer um, and what we'll be looking at is, is based on a what we would call a literal interpretation of scripture and I'll explain that just in a minute but we would read scripture the same way we would read a, a novel a cookbook a history textbook a poem in its normal sense in its normal everyday sense um, obviously it's it's a it's a book given to us by God and we need the help of the Holy Spirit to understand it. Um, but we, we read it in its normal sense as we would other things. Here's a, a quote that I found helpful from uh, Tim Caffrey. I'll just read it to you. You can read along with me. It says, Bible-believing Christians generally follow a method of interpretation known as the historical grammatical approach. That is, we try to find the plain or literal meaning of the words based on an understanding of the historical and the cultural setting, so where, it, where and when it took place, in which the book was written. We then follow standard rules of grammar, everyone's favorite subject, uh, according to the book's particular genre and to arrive at an interpretation. So basically he's, he's saying that we try to understand what the original writer was saying and, and thinking um, instead of trying to put our modern interpretation back into something that, that wasn't meant. Um, so you may say, well, is this really important? Well, actually, it, it is, because depending on how you interpret scripture, you come up with very, very different conclusions, not just about the future, but about uh, what, what scripture says in general. So just two reasons why 
Um, I think we should interpret scripture and prophecy literally as, as was just described. And the first one, God wants us to clearly understand what he has revealed to us. He's not a God of confusion, but a God of order. He has revealed himself and his plans to us. And that's, that means that it's not meant to be a, uh, it says something, but it means something else. Granted, it's, it's not always easy to understand scripture, and uh, 2,000 years of church history can attest to that. Um, but God wants us to understand what he has written. For example, um, back in Genesis, the early, earlier chapters, uh, God promised to Abraham um, a land. He says, I will give this land to you. Look east, north, south, west. This is the land that I'm going to give to you. Um, and I believe that's exactly what he meant. Uh, it it doesn't, doesn't belong to the, the church or, or some other group. In the future, as we will see, God will literally give Abraham and his descendants the land that he promised. Um, so when God promises something, he, he fulfills it, which is tremendously encouraging to us. And secondly, Bible prophecies have already been, that have been fulfilled, have been fulfilled literally. So it's reasonable to assume that the rest of unfulfilled prophecy will be fulfilled literally as well. This is one I love. Um, in Isaiah, twice he names specifically Cyrus. He says Cyrus is going to be one whom God is going to use to subdue the nations. And then 175 years later, Cyrus was born, and then he later um, conquered the, uh, the kingdom of Babylon. Like, by name. <laughs> it just blows me away. And there's two passages in, in Isaiah uh, that refer to him. And of course, all the prophecies about Christ's first coming were, were fulfilled literally, and so we can expect that the, the ones about his second coming will be too. Um, just to, to give you a, a couple examples of things that obviously are not literal, um, in Psalm 98 it says, let the rivers clap their hands and let the mountains sing together for joy. It's a beautiful um, expression of, of, of the joy that's experienced by the, the people and the, and the whole earth. But it's obviously a figure of speech, right? The, the mountains don't sing and the rivers don't clap. Um, but it's a way of expressing the joy that will be evident in that time. And we do that today too. Uh, we use figures of speech to, uh, to explain what we want to, uh, to say. And then the second one, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Joel 2.31. Um, it's probably another figure of speech. Um, it's not likely that the moon will actually be turned to blood, but more likely that it'll look like blood. Uh, people talk about a blood moon um, occurring occasionally. So um, that's another example of, of a figure of speech to convey the meaning. Um, I'm going to skip this. No, actually I won't. Um, this is just another, another definition, but I think it's really helpful, especially the end part. Um, so it's Randall Price, he writes for Israel My Glory, and he's an uh, archaeology uh, prof. Uh, he says, in considering a prophetic view about the future, um, it's important to adopt a position that most consistently follows the literal, historical, grammatical interpretation of the Bible a method that respects the text of scripture, and this is the key, I think, this last part, as being written to a non-technical society that was expected to understand and accept normal human words as God's own word. Right? God expected his people, you know, many of them were, um, you know, were farmers uh, uh, and, and, and so on, uh, not, not scholars, but he expected them to understand the words that he was speaking to them. And I think that's equally true for, for us. All right, I'm going to skip that one. And just if you look here on the screen, um, just a little, a little overview of, um, of what's going to happen in the future, I believe. Um, don't hold me to all the details. <laughs> um, but if you look on the left, the, the top left, you'll see it, you were there. Can everyone see that, where it says you were there? Um, 
I um, actually, Alex, do you have that the um, the the pointer? I forgot to ask you for that this morning, but just so I can point to where. Okay. All right. Um, so right here, um, and what. Uh, what we're in is, is part of what we call the, the church age, almost 2,000 years of church history since the day of Pentecost. Um, and we're somewhere in there. We don't know how, how soon it will be toward uh, what we understand will happen next, uh, the, the rapture of the church where the church is caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4 uh, to be with it forever with the Lord. And that is our hope. And from then on, the church will be forever with the Lord. Um, so while things are going down on earth during the tribulation period, we will be in heaven here uh, enjoying fellowship with the Lord, uh, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, um, and, and we will be completely out of the scene, kept from the wrath to come. Uh, then we will return when Jesus returns at the end of the, uh, the tribulation period, and he will set up his, his kingdom, which is going to be the focus of our time this morning. Um, and then we will continue to be with him for all of eternity, worshiping him um, and being with him in the new heavens and the new earth um, over here. Um, so the, the tribulation period that we referred to last week uh, when we focused on Isaiah chapter 24 was really the second half of what you see up here. Uh, the, uh, the period of more intense uh, judgment by God, the, the wrath of God being poured out um, upon this world. Two primary reasons, I think, for the, the tribulation period. Uh, one, to, uh, uh, as I said, to, for God to, to show his, his anger against sin, the sin of the world, um, and also to awaken the people of Israel to their need for the Messiah. And during the first half of the tribulation period, uh, so over here, um, God will have 144 Jewish men and he will keep them protected and they will be evangelists, uh, witnessing and sharing the gospel with people um, on earth at that time and many will be saved. Uh, it seems that those who have heard the gospel and rejected it before that time will, will believe the Antichrist lie and will not be able to to, to, to believe the gospel, but many people who have not heard the gospel clearly will hear it during that time and be saved. Um, the tribulation period begins uh, here with uh, the world leaders so of the Antichrist making a, a peace treaty with Israel for seven years. Uh, he later breaks that halfway through, sets up his image in the Jewish temple for all to worship, um, and then the more intense judgments follow in the second half, and we looked at that last week in, uh, in Isaiah 24. But I want to focus uh, this morning on the kingdom of Christ, when he's actually reigning on this earth uh, here uh, for a thousand years, and then, of course, for on into eternity as well. Um, a couple things to, to keep in mind. He is, he is the king now, obviously, in, in a sense, he is our king, but we can't see him, and he's, he's sitting on his father's throne. But then he will rule as king over the earth in person. He will, he will be there in, in Jerusalem, um, and the whole earth will be his realm. And his kingdom will last for a thousand years, based on um, what we read in, in Revelation 20. He will reign... Um, Beyond that, he doesn't stop reigning, uh, but we'll see that in the, in the new heavens and the new earth, he will continue to reign um, as king. And, uh, and we see that um, in Revelation uh, 21 and, and 22. And just briefly, um, I found this really interesting. Um, four covenants that God made with um, his people Israel in the past, in the Old Testament, um, unconditional covenants where God promised to do something uh, for his people will all be fulfilled during the millennial reign of Christ. And just, just briefly, we're not going to go over this in, in detail, 
But we see on the left uh, top the um, uh, Abraham. And God made many promises to Abraham, uh, among them um, that his people would inherit the land, uh, that he would have many descendants, and that, that he would be their God forever. Uh, they were made in Genesis 12, 13, uh, 17, and so on. Uh, and they will be fulfilled literally. Where God's people, uh, the, the remnant of Israel that's redeemed, will reign with him uh, and be on the earth with him. Uh, a similar, similar covenant was made with the, the people of Israel at the end of um, uh, Deuteronomy, just before they entered the land. Um, again, that will be fulfilled. Promise to David. God promised David a, a house, a lasting descendants, uh, a throne, and a kingdom that would last forever. And who's going to sit on the throne? Right? The son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, David's king, and his kingdom will be everlasting. And finally, the new covenant that God promised that he would make with the people of Israel. He would take out their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Um, he would forgive their sins. He promised that in, in Jeremiah 31 and in Ezekiel, and that will be fulfilled um, when uh, many, many Jewish people turn to the Lord Jesus. It says in Zechariah that they will look on him whom they have pierced during the tribulation period and mourn for him as for an only son, and they will be cleansed by the blood of Christ um, and, and then enter into the, the millennial kingdom. What is it going to be like? What is it going to be like? There is so much um, about the, the reign of Christ in the Old Testament. There's, there's a lot of material. Uh, and I'm really indebted to, uh, to Dwight Pentecost for kind of summarizing it. And so these categories that I'm gonna, we're going to look at are, are from, uh, from his work. Peace. The Lord Jesus told us that we will have his peace with us now as we live in this world that is anything but peaceful. But in that time, we will experience an even greater sense of, of peace, unity, uh, no more war than ever before. It says in Isaiah 2, they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. They won't even need uh, the weaponry of war because it will not exist. People will get along with each other, they'll be in, in fellowship with God, and it will be a place that we can't even imagine, and yet it's going to happen. Joy, another fruit of the Spirit. Uh, joy will be evident um, in his kingdom. It says, therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And it all comes back to the fact uh, of what we started with at the beginning, is that the Lord Jesus himself will be there with his people, never to be separated from them. We, as part of the church, will be his bride, um, serving and, and and being with him in ways that we don't quite understand. Um, the Jewish and Gentiles who have come out of the tribulation as believers um, will belong to him as well. And the, the joy that will exist in that place is just beyond imagination because we will be with our God and our Savior and our King uh, is there in our midst. Holiness which really just means that we're, we're separated, separate, set apart for, for God's purposes. And in, in Isaiah 4, it says, it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. And those who are, are saved during the, the, the tribulation period, uh, God will cleanse them. He will forgive them, uh, bring them into his kingdom and they will be holy. We as, as a church, um, the Bible tells us that once we're, we're caught up to be with the Lord, he transforms us and he, he gives us uh, new bodies 
Uh, we believe he removes our, our old nature so that we will no longer sin. So we will be holy in, in a completely different sense that we are even now, um, perfectly pleasing to the Lord in every thought, action, attitude, every word, holiness, enjoying the, the, the holy presence of God who is among us. And then glory. Um, Jabe Nicholson once described glory as the, so the outward manifestation of something that's inside. And the glory of God the, the, will be evident. His character will, will, will pervade that place. And it says in Isaiah 35, it will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. And God's glorious presence will be there, just as it was in the, in the tabernacle, in the, in the temple, in the Old Testament times. But now the very person of God will be there in the Lord Jesus, and the glory of God will be seen. And uh, people will rejoice um, in all that God is. Comfort and justice. I put this picture of a, the, uh, the lion there. I couldn't find a, a suitable picture of a, of a king with his bride or with his subjects. Um, but the Lord Jesus is, after all, called the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he will bring tremendous comfort to his people. Uh, the people of Israel have always been persecuted. Um, and even in, in, during the tribulation period, there will be very intense persecution. Uh, many will, will die, uh, especially those who, who believe in him. But now, their enemies will be gone. They will be perfectly at, at peace, uh, protected by the Lord in his comforting and protective presence. And perfect justice will be meted out. I don't think there's a day that goes by that we read about injustice being done um, in this world. There, there is very little true justice. But in that day, he will ensure that, that everything is properly, uh, properly dealt with. Uh, initially, there will only be believers who, who enter the millennium from, the, from the, the tribulation period. Later, they will have many children. Not all will be believers, but they will outwardly have to be uh, obedient to the Lord, but not necessarily in their hearts. But any, any outward disobedience will be judged immediately. Uh, it says in Psalm 2 that he will, he will rule with a rod of iron. Uh, there will be no more injustice. Perfect righteousness will, will be there at all times. Another beautiful verse, uh, one of my favorite, I think, in the Old Testament, um, is that there'll be a full knowledge of God by all people. If you can, if you can see it, read it with me. Let's read the verse together. It says, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isn't that beautiful? Earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The seas are, are some, some of them are miles deep, the oceans. And just imagine, the, the oceans are full and, and covered, and that's how deep and complete the knowledge of God will be for those who live uh, during that time. Even more complete and, and full than, than we can know God now. Um, and all will know him. All will, will know him intimately and enjoy him. It also tells us that the Lord Jesus is not only the, the perfect judge, but he's the perfect teacher. And he will teach uh, and instruct the peoples. But this time, it'll be easy because people will want to hear what he has to say and want to do it. It says, and many peoples will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And people will stream to him from all the nations of the earth to Jerusalem, listen to his teaching, 
hang on every word and then go back and, and want to put it into practice. Um, and he will be the, the, the expert teacher, as he already is. And as the Holy Spirit now teaches us what the word of God means, then the Lord Jesus will be the one that will teach um, and people will desire to do what he has to say. The removal of the curse, or at least a, a partial removal uh, of the curse that, that God put upon the earth and upon humans in, uh, in Genesis. Uh, as the, now the, the, the earth is completely fruitful, uh, abundant produce, sickness is removed, uh, healing of disabilities, uh, there won't be any blind or, or people that can't hear. Um, be perfect health um, in a, in a near-perfect world. Um, and all because the, the perfect healer is there and his people are with him in his midst and he is reigning over them. He will also provide protection for his people, which goes without saying. Um, it says, you will seek those who quarrel with you but you will not find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. For I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. The enemies of the people of God will be gone. Uh, only God's people will remain with him and he will provide his protective presence. Um, I think it's in, in Zephaniah, it talks about him being a, a, a wall of fire um, around the city of Jerusalem as a protective measure for his people. And God and his people will be together um, at all time. Uh, I think we've talked about this already. There will be many children born and uh, have long life. Um, I won't read the whole passage, but if someone, uh, if someone is, uh, dies at 100 years old, they'll be considered just a, a youth, a teenager, right? Um, and if someone doesn't reach the age of 100, they'll be considered uh, cursed. So people will live very long lives uh, like it was in the beginning. And as well, we've touched on this as well, um, labor and economic prosperity. When people plant fields, um, you don't always get a, a full reap. There are many factors like the lack of rain, <laughs> uh, which we're hoping will change today. Um, but in that day, there'll be perfect conditions. Um, there'll be a fruitful planting, a fruitful harvest. People will have enough to eat, plenty, uh, and joyful occupation and, and labor. Uh, there will be an increase of light from Isaiah 30, which may account, too, for the increase in the productivity of, uh, of the harvest. Um, we alluded to this at the beginning, but there will be a unified worship. The last two lines here say, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord, and unitedly uh, save Jews and Gentiles from the tribulation, will be worshiping uh, the Lord. And of course, we as his church will be at his side um, and worshiping and enjoying his presence as well. No other gods will be worshiped or permitted and finally, the, the very presence of God. We've, we've talked about this already before. The very presence of God will be there. His manifest presence. It says, I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And <clears throat> he is in our midst now. Um, the Holy Spirit of God is, is here present. We can't see him. And that day, the Lord Jesus will be visible. We will see him um, and he will dwell uh, in the midst of his people. And finally, the last two, uh, there will be a fullness of the work of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God now works, um, lives in, in us as, as believers, um, trying to manifest the, the life of Christ in us and, and through us to others. In that day, it will be unhindered, and the Spirit of God will be free to work in every, in every person, um, and especially in those who, who belong to the church, who have no more... Uh, sin nature, and, and the evidence of the, the work of the Spirit of God will be, will be universal. As well, these conditions um, that we looked at in the millennium, 
many of them um, in, the, in the Old Testament say that they, they will continue forever. So once the, the millennium is continued and there's a new heavens and a new earth, many of these same conditions will continue to exist in what we often think of as, as heaven, um, the, uh, that heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, um, in which we will, will live uh, for all of eternity. And many of these conditions will exist on into eternity. So again, the question is, what difference should this make in my life? We asked a similar question last week, and uh, I know I, I, it's fun to look into these things, but what's the point? Well, I think the point is um, similar to what we looked at last week. And for this, for the last five minutes, I'm just going to have you turn to um, 1 Peter chapter 1. We've looked at a lot of scriptures on the screen, but let's just look together at what Peter has to say again. Last time we were in 2 Peter 3, but now 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, I'm indebted to uh, Andrew Schwarzentruber. I don't know if he's here today, um, but um, he had sent me a, a video link that uh, actually focused on this passage, and I thought this is a perfect um, way to, uh, to, to tie this together and, and show how this should make a difference in our lives. So we're just going to read verses 9 to 12 um, of uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were not, you were, you, for you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So I think there's four things that he's saying here. First of all, in verse 9, he says, we belong to God. And there's four, four uh, ways in which he describes us, which are wonderful in itself. Uh, a chosen race. So God has somehow chosen us uh, to be his people. A royal priesthood. We are, we are priests. And that's why uh, we encourage uh, all believers to, to worship God and to serve as God has gifted them, just like the Old Testament priests did. We don't need a, um, an ordained uh, person to, to do the work of God. Um, all believers are, are priests. We're a holy nation. We're set apart for God's purposes. And we're a people for God's own possession. We belong to him. And he wants us um, to, be, to be completely for him. And the reason, so that uh, you may declare his praises or his excellencies to others. Right? He's called us. He's brought us out of the domain of darkness, out of Satan's domain. And he's brought us into his glorious presence, into, into the light of his presence. And he says, I want you to, uh, to tell others that you belong to God. Secondly, we're now citizens of heaven. Um, uh, in verse 10, it talks about us being a, the people of God. But then in verse 11, in the beginning, it says, I urge you as aliens and strangers. Right? Like Abraham, this is not our, this is not our, our, our place anymore. Abraham was looking forward to a city, and, and we are too. We're, we're, we're passing through here, and our, our city is, is the one to come in the future. Um, and so we don't, we don't belong here, in a sense. We're, we're passing through, we live here, but it's not our ultimate destination. And then verses 11 and 12, uh, he urges us to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Right? The, the, the three enemies of God will do everything they can um, to bring us under temptation and, and, and to 
fall to that temptation. And there's a, there's a spiritual war. We're being attacked, and we need to put on our spiritual armor and fight in the, in the strength of God and, and his spirit. And the reason why, um, well, two reasons why, because ultimately we're not gonna be here, so we, we wanna live as kingdoms, uh, as children of the, uh, of the kingdom that is to come already. But also in verse 12, uh, it's a little tricky as you read through it, but basically I think it means that he wants to save unbelievers as a result of our good behavior. Often people that don't know the Lord will say, you know, will, will accuse Christians of either being crazy or wasting their time or of doing strange things, right? Because they don't understand um, what, what we do. And in, in Peter's day, I think it was the same. You know, they were, they were accused of having strange things going on in their meetings and what you know, what kind of evildoers were they? But as the, as the Christians were observed, as they saw the way they lived, as they saw the, the good deeds that they performed, they realized that they were different. And it caused these unbelievers to rethink things and to get saved. And then when they met in heaven, they would meet as, as friends. Um, and, and the unbelievers would be able to glorify God because they'd been saved and were later in heaven. So as a result of what the, the Christians had done. So I guess we start where we, we finish where we started. Um, and it's all about our relationship with the, the Lamb of God or the, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, our relationship with the Lord and once he comes and takes us home, we will be forever with him. We'll be changed, part of his bride, uh, serving along with him. But we're not going to be here forever. I don't know. I'm not making any predictions. <laughs> we can't do that. Um, but we know that at any time, the Lord Jesus could come back to take his church. So what, what do the unbelievers think of us? And... Uh, let them see uh, Christ in us, in the way we speak, the way we live, the way we serve, and may it be a way of, of bringing others to him as they see that we are different because we belong to him. Anyway, let's, let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you uh, for your Son, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and the Lamb whose blood has cleansed us from all sin and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God. Our Father, we thank you that uh, we belong to him now and our final home is, is not here on earth, but it's with him and wherever he is, we will be. And we're just so thankful uh, for that. We pray that as we uh, are more and more caught up with with him and what he is doing, that others would see uh, the difference it makes in our lives and desire to know more about him as well. So just uh, watch over us, our Father, this week or until the Lord Jesus comes back. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we have a, a break now until uh, just before 11 o'clock.